and military personnel could soon be on the way to Iraq. Targeted airstrikes by U.S. forces continue against ISIS militants in the north. But hitting those targets could soon get a lot more complicated. Meanwhile, complicated is an understatement for the internal Iraqi politics that have led to yet another leadership crisis in Baghdad. We have Fox team coverage tonight. Greg Palcott in Erbil, Iraq, with a country under new management waiting for old management to leave. James Rosen here in Washington with what the administration's call for an inclusive Iraqi government really means. But we begin with national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon with news of an even deeper U.S. involvement. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Shannon. Sources tell us the Pentagon is in the process of sending more than 100 additional military planners to Iraq to develop a strategy for relocating the tens of thousands of Yazidis trapped in the Sinjar mountain range. U.S. defense officials say the Herculean effort to airlift the Yazidi refugees to safety would take hundreds of flights and 10 days or more of constant round-trip missions. No help, nothing, and we have nothing just to say, just you want safe zone for Yazidi. We don't want lag, no, no money, no oil, no higher position. We want to live in peace. The airlift would come with considerable risk, Pentagon officials warn. Earlier today, an Iraqi rescue helicopter crashed, carrying veteran New York Times correspondent Alyssa Rubin and two photographers. The Iraqi pilot was killed. The American journalist suffered a concussion and wrist injuries. To date, the U.S. has not encountered any anti-aircraft fire, but that could change given the heavy weaponry ISIS has at its disposal. Administration officials indicated there are strings attached to any further their offer to help Iraq's central government. America is prepared to intensify its security cooperation as Iraq undertakes and makes progress for political reform. Meanwhile, there is evidence ISIS is shifting its tactics in the wake of U.S. airstrikes. Until now, ISIS has behaved like a well-organized army, moving with strategic intent and taking military objectives as it marched across Iraq. Now some of its units appear to be relying on classic insurgency tactics. One of the things that we have seen with the ISIL forces is that where they have been in the open, they are now starting to dissipate and to hide and uh, amongst the people. So the targeting of this is going to become more difficult. In order for the airstrikes to be effective, U.S. ground forces would be needed to permanently push ISIS back, something that has been ruled out by the Obama administration. There will be no reintroduction of American combat forces into Iraq. But as one well-placed Pentagon source put it to me, F-18s are not a strategy. Pentagon officials are very frustrated that they are in essence being asked to play whack-a-mole right now from the air. Shannon. Jennifer, live at the Pentagon, thank you. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki today ordered security forces to stay out of the political tug-of-war he's having with the country's new leadership team. Senior Foreign Affairs correspondent Greg Palcott has the latest on Iraq's internal insecurity from Erbil tonight. Tense times on the streets of Baghdad. Security, including militias, backing embattled incumbent Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki out in force. This after Iraqi President Fouad Massoum named moderate politician Haider al-Ibadi as the next Prime Minister, asking him to form a government. Even though al-Ibadi is in the same party as al-Maliki, which won the most votes in recent elections, the current PM branded the move illegal, told the army to steer clear of politics, and claimed militants might take advantage. What I am scared of is that al-Qaeda gangs, the Islamic State group, and insurgents might try to make use of the current tension. But with the Islamic State or ISIS rampaging through northern Iraq, the pressure is on al-Maliki, seen as sectarian and divisive, to back down. The U.S. is flatly saying no broad help to battle the terrorists and assist Iraq will come without change. We are prepared to consider additional political, economic, and security options as Iraq starts to build a new government. Hopeful news to the people here in Kurdistan and northern Iraq. The tough Kurdish Peshmerga fighters on the front line in the battle with ISIS are asking for more weapons from the U.S. And refugees, including Christians, who've been told to convert to Islam or die, are being sheltered in the Kurdish city of Erbil. They're looking for aid and security. Sentiments echoed back in Baghdad, which has seen its own rising toll of terror attacks. We hope that the new prime minister will provide us with security and stability and all humanitarian necessities. 
Vice President Biden also hopping on the bandwagon yesterday. The White House saying that Biden called Iraqi President Fouad Massoum and the Prime Minister designate Haider al Abadi to set, tell that, them that the U.S. supports an inclusive government in Iraq, especially as it fights the Islamic State militants. Shannon. We'll talk with the panel more about that. Greg, thank you. The U.S. and much of the West. Tonight, Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen looks at what President Obama and others want to see out of Baghdad. We continue to call on Iraqis to come together and form the inclusive, gov uh, inclusive government. They need a, an inclusive government in place as soon as possible. There's we hear it every day, like a mantra. But what does this demand for inclusiveness in the Iraqi government actually mean? And how and when did Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki fail to embrace it, to the point where the Obama administration worked stealthily to replace him, despite the plurality that Maliki and his party won in Iraq's parliamentary elections just four months ago? A few hours ago I spoke with Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki. It was really after President Obama announced the withdrawal of the last U.S. forces from Iraq in 2011 that the Shiite Prime Minister, long suspected of sectarianism, took actions that sharply divided the Iraqi government. He issued an arrest warrant for Iraq's Sunni Vice President and moved to purge the Iraqi army down to the brigade level of Sunni officers and replace them with Shiites. Those were key signals that he was looking uh, at Iraq through eyes that were predominantly sectarian. And U.S. officials say these sectarian divisions explain why the Iraqi army crumbled, despite superior numbers and firepower, when confronted by the terrorist army known as ISIS. With Shiite politician Haider al-Abadi nominated to succeed al-Maliki and enjoying U.S. backing as he forms a new government, the State Department set forth its expectations. One of the things we've been quite uh, heartened by is, is the really unprecedented way the Iraqi security forces have been working with the Kurdish forces, for example. And the Kurds represent still another challenge for the Obama administration, whose top diplomats have had to make the case in Kurdistan as to why now, Shannon, is not the right time to pursue statehood. Very complicated conversation. Indeed. James, thank you. Thank you. Well, Ukraine's